Good evening, everyone. This is Luke Grand speaking. We're so glad to have you here on this new Farminar. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I wanted to start with a little introduction, and then we'll get started right away as soon as I uh, get, get a couple announcements out of the way. Uh, we're all here today because we care about farmers, and we care about communities, and we care about families earning a good living here in Iowa as farmers. And so I wanted to just have a couple photos of different members that, that uh, we have. Uh, one of those members is out in western Iowa. Uh, Vic and Cindy Madsen, uh, this is their farm here. Uh, and uh, the great folks and, and have been really important in, in helping shape uh, this organization over, over more than two decades now. And folks like, folks like the Madsons, uh, are, you know, maybe, maybe you, your farm looks a little like this, uh, where you're coming from tonight. And just wanted to kind of give a shout out to uh, this is the, these are the people that, that direct our organization. We're a farmer-led organization, and we're all here to, to help other farmers learn from each other. And not just for profit, but for communities' uh, vibrancy and, and actually uh, conservation farming, too. We are helping folks learn how to use cover crops, as you can see here in this photo. Uh, folks look, looking at uh, cover crops in the fall and seeing how that can reduce uh, soil erosion potentially and help out in a bunch of other ways. But we don't just need a good profit and good uh, environment to grow the next year's crop in. We also need communities, strong uh, human, human capital uh, relationships and, and ways to work with landowners and farmers and neighbors. And that's uh, kind of what, what makes Practical Farmers of Iowa great is that we've got all those three big important uh, areas uh, covered, we hope, because we all care about the next generation, right? We all care about uh, the folks that come after us so we can all leave this world in a better place than what we found it in. So here we are in our winter farm in our series, a great way to learn online from your farms across the state and across the country. We've uh, had a great winter series, and we're now in, ending up uh, with just a couple more left, so we hope you can join us next week and the week after for our final concluding winter farm in ours. Uh, great uh, topic tonight on feed alternatives to high corn, corn and soybean prices. The process, the way this works, is after brief introductions from the speakers, we will have a discussion until about 8 o'clock uh, with the, the speakers as the main uh, focus of the, of the discussion and let, letting Drew's question kind of lead the night. And then we'll have a full half hour at least uh, to, to have your questions from the audience. And so put, please feel free to put your questions in throughout in the chat box and we will address those questions. Uh, from Cindy and Drew's perspectives. We will conclude uh, right at 8.30 so we can get on to our next uh, activities. And these will all, this is also all going to be recorded so you can go back and watch it later. Practicalfarmers.org slash Farminar is the place where you can go to find all of our 64 online recordings, 90-minute uh, sessions with farmers as the experts, all available online for you to check out after they've been delivered. I want to encourage everybody to join Practical Farmers of Iowa. I see a lot of great members here in the chat box. Thank you all for joining us. And, and do, if you're not a member, you're welcome to join. Just 20 bucks a year for students and 50 bucks for the whole farm. You can keep up with our great activities, over 100 events. We uh, help coordinate each year with farmers uh, in, the, in the forefront. I'm wondering, Cindy, could you turn off your mic? What would you like me to do? Could you just mute your mic? Mute it? Yeah, if you just click the microphone button again. Okay, thank you. I was, I was hearing myself uh, through your speakers, um, so I wanted to have you mute that for now. We'll bring you back in later when it's your turn to, to speak. Um, so join Practice Farms of Iowa. It's a great organization, and keep up with us on Facebook. You can click and check out our link. We've got a lot of great photos, including a, a video link of the Master Researchers. We just had a video. Uh, released this week we wanted to share with you. A great in-person event if you're free on March 14th. Definitely want to encourage folks to sign up for this great opportunity to learn about managing farm laborers. Uh, all sorts of really great topics and I've brought a list of things to talk about. I'll grab that. There, we, there it is. Okay. Uh, employees make it possible to get more stuff done on the farm, but managing workers and their work takes dedicated time, energy, and processes. Whether you manage one seasonal worker or a year-round large crew of workers, good management can make the difference between making headway on your farm's work or just creating headaches. Join farmer and educator Chris Blanchard to learn how to create a productive, positive work environment by communicating clear expectations and implementing systems for efficiency. 
Topics are going to include hiring and firing employees, developing an employee manual, implementing systems for accountability, time tracking, payroll, daily and weekly planning, and leadership management. Great opportunities to learn good topics on employee management. Sign up uh, RSVP to Lauren, Practical Farmers Ohio staff member Lauren Zastro at practicalfarmers.org is her email, or call the office. Great opportunity to meet in person and learn from farmers. And if you're interested in on-the-job training, we've got 10 spots available right now this year to work on a farm across Iowa. You can see the red dots on the screen there. Great opportunity to learn from all sorts of farms, all different enterprises, and uh, including livestock and row crops and horticulture and everybody. So great list of folks. Check out the website and pass that opportunity along to the beginner in your life who might uh, want to have some more on-farm experience. That's all I had. We'll start with Drew Leitz, who will t tell us a little bit about himself and uh, lead the discussion with Cindy McCullough. Dr go ahead, Drew. Thank you. All right. Great. Thanks, Luke. Um, well, I, I guess uh, my name is Drew Leitz, and I have recently got into raising pigs. Um, and this, uh, this spring will be my first time uh, farrowing. So right now I'm sort of working on a lactation diet. Uh, so I guess to back up, I, I got some gilts uh, last May, late April and early into early May. And, uh, and I got some boars in the early part of October. So they've been around our farm here for a while. And right now I guess from a feed standpoint, I'm looking at uh, what what can I put together for this spring for a lactation diet and then also a gestating diet moving forward. So, so that's my little introduction, I guess. Maybe Cindy wants to give hers. Okay, can you hear me? Did that work out? Can you hear me, Luke? Okay. All right. Um, I'm. Uh, I run an organic feed mill here in Webster City, Iowa, and I. Uh, I guess I have an animal science degree from Iowa State University in uh, animal science, and I primarily work with organic grains. And so, if you have a lot of questions about conventional grains, I may not know all the pricing on the conventional grains, but I'll certainly try to help put together a ration using cereal grains and maybe some alternative ideas on uh, some different proteins, but I'm not sure how available they are on the conventional side. So uh, hopefully we can work from there. So do you want me just to take uh, Drew's questions first on the, the gestating and lactating diets. Yeah, that, that'd be fine with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess I would, um, as far as uh, what are you feeding now? Help me out with what you're feeding now, and that might help me. Okay, so currently my gestating diet is uh, I, I have a component of alfalfa hay. Um, so it's 100 so it's pounds 100 of alfalfa pounds hay, 100 of premix, 300 of soybean meal, and 1,500 of corn. Okay, so you're running about a 13, 14 I'm going to jump in real quick. Sorry to interrupt yeah, yeah. real quick. Um, I'm here in... Uh, I'm hearing Drew through your uh, microphone, Cindy, and I'm wondering if if you have headphones you can plug in real quick. Uh, let's see here. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We'll wait for you. You're worth the wait. <laughs> I'm not really sure how to use that. I had to turn it up so that I could hear Drew. So maybe I can just adjust the the speaker. 
Yeah, you could if you, if the headphones if you got headphones and you should be able to to uh, run the volume up real real loud on the headphones without uh, sending that sound back through the microphone. My problem is, is I don't I don't have the headphones where I can get to them. Okay. Okay. So is it going to be really bad that the feedback? Maybe. Instead, every time you need to talk, just uh, um, every time you're done talking, you just mute your mic, and that way Drew's voice won't come through your microphone. Okay, I can do that. All right, go ahead, go ahead, Drew. Okay, well, uh, I guess my first question would be uh, to formulate a either a gestating or a, a lactating diet. Um, well, for for pigs or for any animals that you work with, uh, do you focus? What is your first focus? Is it energy? Is it protein? Uh, what what component is your first focus? Okay, the first component would be is that I want to make sure that the ba that the diet was balanced. And so we'd want to make sure that we had uh, enough protein to keep her happy, enough energy so that she'd be fine in the cold, and then um, your carbohydrates, which would be your corn, which we could also replace with some cereal grains. Do the Nyman Ranch growers let their pigs go out on uh, pasture? Yes, we can. I don't. I don't know a lot that do. I think a lot. I th think a lot of Nyman farmers uh, farrow in pasture, but I don't think a lot finish in pasture. Okay, so your gestating sows are allowed out on grass in the summertime. No. Uh, well, I haven't had I haven't had that situation yet. Um, my my lactating sows will be out. Uh, on grass this spring. Okay, this is where I'm trying to learn the difference between organics and Nyman Ranch. Um, it's always good to allow um, them to have alfalfa. Uh, I think that's an excellent protein source that you can use because it's like a 17%. And it kind of has just a real good broad use for uh, lactating sows. It keeps her, her digestive uh, tract moving, so that kind of helps. And um, as far as your ration overall, uh, your probably your biggest cost is the protein. And so if that's where we could make adjustments, that's where we should try to do so. And um, soybean meal, is probably your biggest cost and so if we could use other grains to help offset that protein but yet keep, in, keep enough soybean meal in it so that you're getting the, the fat and uh, the lysine and the assorted other amino acids from that, that'd be great. And I always like to use two to three different protein sources. So your alfalfa meal would be one, soybean meal could be another and then you could use Part of it could be canola meal, part of it could be fish meal, part of it could be um, uh, ground peas, uh, milk products. So those would be all different options that you could use to help get that to a 13% protein. Uh, you could get there with cereal grains, but I think you'd be disappointed in how she would do. We're just missing enough amino acids using just cereal grains, but you really do need to have some other forms of protein in there. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I know you mentioned uh, some some substitutes for soybean meal, such as canola, fish, ground peas, etc. Um, which of those uh, would be the highest? So, like, if I wanted to substitute out 100 pounds per ton of soybean meal. Uh, what would I need to, I mean, is there such thing as a perfect replacement or, you know, I'm kind of asking about the protein content of these alternatives. Um, if, if one would require more than another or, you know. 
Okay. Um, well, you had asked earlier about using canola meal. Uh, that's pretty close to that of soybean meal, but it's running about 10% less protein than that of an expelled soybean meal. If you're using a solvent soybean meal, that could be as high as 48% versus 44. Canola is running around 34. And so that wouldn't be too hard of an adjustment to make. Um, you could almost split it in half and go half and half and be pretty close to where you were. Um, the peas run about a 26%. You'd want to grind those. So again, you'd probably want to do uh, close to a 2 to 1, maybe a little less than that if you use peas. Uh, the fish meal is running 63%. So you see you'd run it the other direction. So 50 pounds of fish meal could probably offset almost 80 pounds of uh, a soybean meal. And so you could kind of mix and match those to come up with the ration that you're comfortable with. Because fish meal can be expensive. It's really where you start to look for your least cost inputs. And if you've got a good source for ground peas, then that would be the direction to go. If you've got a good source of canola meal, you might take all your, you know, a good portion of your soybean meal out and use that. Um, and then use the alfalfa meal as your third protein source. Uh, a lot of people on sow diets uh, do use a lot of oats because it's almost like the perfect feed at almost 11 percent uh, protein, pushing 12 percent. You've got good fiber. But again, the cereal grains are lacking in some of the amino acids, so you're going to want to have just enough of that soybean meal to offset that. So if you went with corn, oats, and soybean meal, that'd be a good ration for that of your uh, sows. And Let's see, I'd have to sit down and figure one out for you, but uh, maybe later on I'll have time to do that. Okay. Um, could you talk about, I know you're located in north central Iowa, sort of about the availability of uh, some of the items we've mentioned like canola and fish meal and ground peas and oats. Uh, what's kind of been available at the current time? in your location. Could you repeat that? I'm kind of reading through it. You want to know what grains I have available to me? Right. Yep. Right. Well, the key ones that we're using here are corn and soybean meal. We use a lot of oats, barley. Uh, we're using barley to help offset the cost of corn. Uh, we're also using oats to offset the, the price of corn. You can kind of go oats as 100% to that of corn, so you could almost go a one-to-one -one in transferring those back and forth. Barley runs about a 95% feed value of that of corn. Uh, we use wheat, uh, just whatever is the most price competitive. Uh, ground peas for us are running almost $8 less per bushel than that of soybean meal, so we've been incorporating a lot more ground uh, peas into the diet. We also like the fact that that hardens up the fat a little bit on the pigs, and so we'll bring in the peas so that we don't get, if you overfeed the canola or the soybean meal, you might get too soft of a fat for the pig. Um, and, and so, the, you know, I'm not sure what your end user is looking for, but sometimes if the fats get too soft, they're not happy with it. And, and so what we like to do in our rations is use multiple grains because then if you use like three different protein sources, you're going to pick up all your amino acids and all of your, you know, micronutrients without having to really be as concerned about whether or not your ration is balanced. It's kind of the cheater's way of doing it. And um, so that's why we like to use multiple grains. Uh, for me, the price of corn is almost fifteen fifty a bushel, so we're really looking at using more cereal grains to offset corn as well as the soybeans. And uh, that's why we're using the oats and the barley to help push that protein up to begin with. And then we turn around and can lessen the amount of soybean meal we put in the diet, although we do continue to use it because it does have the higher levels of methionine in it where your cereal grains are really lacking in the 
the lysine and the methionine, the soybean meal, the fish meal, which I now see is not available to the Nyman ranch growers, um, can really pick up some of those amino acids you might otherwise be lacking. Uh, the reason I worry about that is because on the organic side, we cannot supplement these. And so we have to be able to pick them up out of the grains. Is that an issue for, for the Nyman ranch growers? So, um, hmm. maybe could you talk a little bit about, uh, well, one question I had, I guess, uh, since you work with different growers, what what has been a, uh, a ration that includes the fewest or the, the least amount of soybean meal? Uh, you know, for pigs or for poultry or... Okay, a sample ration that I would have, that would be about a 14% ration, would have like 790 pounds of corn, 150 pounds of soybean meal, 250 pounds of wheat, 250 pounds of barley, 200 pounds of ground peas, 300 pounds of, of oats, and then have alfalfa hay available. And then, of course, your vitamin mineral mix at about 60 pounds. And, and you could run that up to 100 pounds and back, you know, probably your oats or your corn off a little bit. And that way we're using a wide range of, of all the different grains. And that's probably more complicated than what somebody who's trying to mix it on the farm would want. And so for those guys, we do a corn, a bean, and a uh, oats. And in that ration, let me see, I have a, just a basic 16% growing ration, and you could back this down, but that'd be like 1,200 pounds of, of ground corn, 350 pounds of soybean meal, 300 pounds of oats, and then your vitamin mineral mix. And that'd be just a real basic ration for growing pigs, which would be simple for most people to put together. But that right now is, is the common one and probably a little more expensive. Um, another one that you could use for growing pigs would be like 625 pounds of corn. You can tell we're cutting the corn down because at $15 a bushel we just can't use much. Um, we're running about 260 pounds of soybean meal. 250 pounds of wheat, 250 pounds of peas, 250 pounds of oats, the barley at 250. We'll put in 30 to 50 pounds of fish meal, depending on what level we need to be at. And then we'll put in some kelp just for the micronutrients, as well as adding in the vitamin mineral mix. And again, we always like to make sure that they have access to some form of alfalfa, legume, you know, just to keep the fiber moving in the system. Those, mm -hmm. Are those rations that would be usable for you guys? Uh, that's a good question. I would have to, uh, I'd have to talk to my field agent. I, I think so. Other than the fish meal, I think any of the other ingredients would be available for Nyman Ranch growers. Um, I was also I would like to ask you too about uh, barley. You talked about barley as a good substitute for corn, uh, and I just I was just curious, uh, is that available? Uh, is it cost effective? I guess. And um, I'm not on the organic side. It's cheaper for us to use barley and oats than it is for us to use corn, and for and with the drought, we had really good small cereal grains come in. And uh, they were heavier than normal. Uh, we had a lot of 40 plus pound oats come in. The barley came in nice and clean. So we were using that in the place of corn. Plus we could, when we mix the, um, the barley, the oats, and the wheat, it's almost a one to one on corn, you know, as far as substitution. Uh, and so from that standpoint, uh, we can get by with it, but you have to watch it because like on oats, if you get beyond like a third of the ration in oats, it just is too much fiber for the baby pigs or the younger pigs. You can use it in the sows, but we have a lot more trouble with growing pigs with that much fiber being brought into the diet. 
So if you could use oat grouts, that's almost a 16% protein, and that would really, you know, it's very usable and highly digestive for the, for the littler pigs. Um, and again, as far as the barley, mm -hmm. you know, it's a 95% of the food value, that of corn. And so it is easy to pull some of the corn out and bring in some of the, the barley. And I just think that the pigs, it, there's a lot of them that claim that it adds a nuttier flavor to the meat. Um, I just find that it's more filling and it gives you another, oh, I don't know, just a, a better variety of grains in the diet. So I don't think you'd have any problems, you know, bringing oats, barley, or wheat. Mm -hmm. Wheat can get kind of pricey sometimes, but barley and oats are fairly, at least in my markets, mm -hmm. you know, readily available. And, and so we do use quite a bit of it. And I think, at least in my markets, oats are coming in at five and six dollars per bushel. And you figure, when you're figuring cost effectiveness, if you can double the price of oats, and if it's less than the price of corn, it's going to be a better food value or feed value for you. And that's why we've been incorporating oats in almost every ration. So I haven't used any oats or barley. How, do, how does barley compare price-wise to corn? I guess I don't know on the organic side or the conventional side. If For me, oats, if you had $5 oats and doubled that, that would be higher than uh, my price for corn conventionally, maybe not for organic corn, but that's where I Are oats running? I don't know. I don't know if that's true. If I don't know if conventional oats would be. Uh, I don't know well, if conventional corn oats would be. Uh, well, con corn would be about seven dollars, or a little over on the conventional, conventional side now, and so I don't know if oats would be less than. I really don't know what the price of conventional oats are. I just know that I bought oats at around five dollars a bushel uh, at harvest, oat harvest. And I was able, you know, and fifteen dollar corn, you know, when I double that, I'm I'm five dollars in the in the positive for myself, and so that's why we've been incorporating it. Um, it looks like Luke is saying it's three dollars per bushel uh, for conventional wheat, oats, he says, and so it it would be cheaper to incorporate oats into your even the conventional diets. And so that's another thought. And I just think oats are about the perfect food for lactate or for gestating sows. Um, if you put them on cereal grains and alfalfa, I think that your pig could you could get by with very little protein supplemented into a, a gestating sows diet, at least in those first, you know, two trimesters. You know, by the time you get to the end you probably want to start supplementing more protein. But uh, you know, if you're using oats and barley you're already at your 13%, which is about where you'd want those sows anyway. And if you're supplementing with the, the alfalfa hay, you're giving them a pretty good boost at a 17% if it's a good quality hay. How does barley compare uh, to corn? How does, how does barley compare uh, to corn? Well, organic so barley is running pretty close to $11, and barley runs at about 48 pounds, I think it is, per bushel. And and so cost-wise, it's pretty pretty much the same as that of, of corn. I'm not saving near what I would be with the oats. Uh, wheat, we're kind of in that same, you know, it's a 60 pounds per bushel of wheat, I think, and it's running around that 1450 and we're running at about 15 on corn, so it's pretty much the same one-to-one -one as well. Mm -hmm. I think in Luke's book for the farm in our tonight, he also mentioned uh, triticale. I think 
in Luke's book for the Parmenar tonight, he also mentioned uh, Triticale as an additional substance. I'm not as familiar with Triticale as I'd like to be. I know it's running at about a 14.7% protein. You don't want to grind it too small, but that's true of almost all small grains. But you do want to grind it. It's a real hard seed coat. Um, and I would use it very similar to that as I would with wheat. And, and you d again, I wouldn't go over 50% of the ration with triticale, uh, as I wouldn't go over 50% of the ration with, uh, with wheat. So a corn triticale would probably be very similar to a, a corn wheat diet. You could go pretty close to a 50-50 blend and then add in your soybean meal with that or your protein source. I have a guy here who uh, has a, a meal that's recommending peanut meal. Um, the problem with peanut meal is it's like a lot of different legumes. You've got to watch how much peanut meal you put in there because you could get a very loose fat, uh, just like if you were feeding a lot of soybeans. I'm not sure if you have to roast a peanut or if you can feed it raw. And, but I would think that it would be very similar to that of feeding a legume. I've just not used a lot of peanut meal. And some of the other non-GMM protein sources, again, if you don't have peas available to you, this is going to Paul Ewing. If you don't have peas available to you and you can't use fish meal, you're really going to have to look at milk products if you can make sure that those are non-GMO or if you could come in with your alfalfa products, which are the 17%. Um, you could work a ration with that uh, without too much trouble, I would think. And I don't know much about Texas. I don't know if clover can grow in Texas or not, uh, but I would treat it very similar to a legume, but I'm not positive what the protein uh, content is in clover, if that's the same as alfalfa or not. And Drew, maybe you can help me out with this. Um, there's a question here about asking if uh, canola has been genetically modified. Is there, is there GMO canola? Not that I'm aware of. I could be wrong, but mm. I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. But I could be wrong, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not aware of. But, and I'm thinking canola is primarily coming out of Canada. Is that where you're sourcing your canola? Yeah. And so I'm not sure if we're even growing much canola in the Midwest. Yeah. But so it's a product that I don't use, and so I'm just not familiar with um, the genetically modified aspects of canola. And, oh, fish meal. And the gentleman, this Paul Ewing, asking about fish meal. Um, I was thinking that uh, the Nyman Ranch pigs can't use fish meal, but fish meal is a very commonly used product in swine feeds, as is whey products. Um, if you can get milk products, it's, it's a very good um, addition to protein for pig skim milk and uh, whey products. And you can go up to a gallon to a gallon and a half of milk per day per pig. And I'm trying to read through the questions really quick. Uh, and I've got a question here. How much protein can be offset by feeding liquid whey? Um, boy, I'd have to look and actually see, but liquid whey, I've only used the powdered whey in the past, but again, I would treat it very similar to um, a skim milk and go with no more than, a, you know, 10 to 12 pounds per day. But as far as the actual protein offset on that, I'm not positive. I'd have to look that up and let him know. Can you feed too much whey? I would think if you fed too much whey, you would have a pig that would get pretty loose. Um, 
Have you had any experience with that, Drew? No, I haven't. Um, I guess my thought is to try to stay within that 10 to 12 pounds, especially if it's a liquid, because otherwise they're going to fill too much up with the liquid, and I'm just not sure if they would consume enough of the other um, your feed feeding units. And, and again, there's a lot of discussion here on uh, the, the genetically modified canoles. Again, it's a product that I have never used, and so I've used some sesame meal, but that's pretty pricey, but it is comparative to organic soybean meal at about $1,200 a ton. Have, um, you got any other questions, Drew, that we might be able to, to look at here? Yeah, well, I guess we keep, we keep going on and on about uh, protein. Yeah, well, I guess you keep, we keep going on and on about uh, protein. Do you recommend, and you recommend multiple sources of protein, do you recommend uh, like a limit? Well, using flaxseed meal um, or uh, flaxseed or linseed meal, and also if you're using, um, there was another one that, uh, or field peas, I guess if you're feeding flaxseed, you shouldn't really exceed uh, more than than half of the diet, or you should you should make sure that you're feeding some other type of protein with it. You can't just do a complete switch to a lot of these different proteins. Um, you'll have a better response, and this is primarily due to the amino acids. Um, you really need to put flaxseed with uh, field peas or with some soybean meal in order to make sure that you've got enough lysine and methionine in the diet. But you guys can supplement that, and that's something that I have to do through the grains. And so that's that's why I worry more about that than you probably have to. And uh, Joel has made a comment here that he uses two-thirds corn, one-third oats, and he soaks it in whey for three days, and he says that makes a great feeding pig ration. And I would think that that would be, you know, because you're going to be running at about, well, with the way the protein, you're probably going to run with about a 16% protein on that particular ration that Joel has put up there. And if you're close to a dairy or a place that makes cheese, they're always looking for a place to get rid of their whey. And so if you can access that, that's a tremendous way to get whey product. Um, the other thing is that a lot of times, if you're feeding a lot of cereal grains, if you can put them out on alfalfa pasture um, throughout the summer, you would have to do very little protein supplement. You could just put protein supplement with your vitamin supplement and put that in with your, your cereal grains, and you would probably have a fairly, you know, 14 to 16 percent diet. I wouldn't recommend it for little pigs. But you could certainly get a fairly good growing pig that's at 75 to 125 pounds. It's a good size to put out on pasture that way. And it would cut your protein costs down quite a bit. But you want it to be a well-established alfalfa field. They'll tear it up pretty good. Uh, and then Ben Brown is asking about whether or not you can feed uh, uh, byproducts from chicken butcherings like feet, necks, organ meat. As an organic meal, I have um, I have to do totally vegan diets, um, so I have no idea. Um, I know that you can use a lot of tankage, but I think that there's rules that it does have to be cooked. Good, and I see Drew is saying the same thing that he's got to do all vegan diets. Okay, because that's, I, I have no experience working with food, uh, meat or uh, tankage of any type. Um, other things that you might not think about is maybe using potatoes. 
Um, you don't want to do more than a third of the diet, if, but if you've got a lot of potatoes or tubers, um, this is another product that you can use as a carbohydrate. You do run into issues with not getting enough carotene if you overfeed it, but it's a great uh, filler for your pigs. And um, But again, I wouldn't exceed over a third of the diet with potatoes or uh, sweet potatoes or something like that. Uh, sugar beets, I think any of the tubers, you could fall into that category and you would be fine. I'm not exactly sure what the protein or, or any of the feed analysis is on sugar beets, but I would put it at, again, no more than a third of the diet. Uh, sunflowers are also another good product. It's high in oil. If you can access it, you can go up to 50% of the diet with that as well. And it would be another good protein source, probably running in that 22 to 24% protein as well. We've had some guys trying to grow corn and uh, sunflowers together for cattle diets and they've had really good luck with it, and uh, so it might be another option for pigs as well. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure what Paul Ewing's question is, is that, yes, they're omnivores, but I'm not sure what he's asking here. Uh, as far as the, the uh, Nyman Ranch pigs, everything has to be a vegan diet, but it can be non-GMO as long as it's antibiotic free. Is that right, Drew? Yeah. Okay, and Paul Ewing says that he's selling pastured pork and he can use tankage fish meal, blood or bone meal, as long as it's approved standards by the USDA. And, you know, I, I don't have a problem with people feeding um, meat products. It's just not something that I can do as an organic feed meal. Uh, I have to really watch myself even on what percentage of fish meals that we incorporate. I also, I also don't have a problem with it. Uh, just for me as well, I have to be an all vegetarian diet for my market. I also, I also don't have a problem with it. Uh, exactly. you got well. to do meet your needs from diet. what you're trying to feed to. It all depends on your customer. Uh, Chicory is an excellent feed source. Um, you know, another natural dewormer, now that Dana brings that up, is the milk products are also natural um, dewormers for the organic growers. And chicory not only is a good dewormer, but it also is a, a medicinal overall. And a lot of people will grow that in their fence lines and let the pigs kind of pick and choose that and comfrey um, as, as a good way for them to keep their pigs more healthy. So yes, that's that's out there. I don't really incorporate it into my rations, but it is nice if you've got pasture pigs to have it out in your pastures. Can you use dewormers, Drew? Yes. Okay. That would be something I would consider. Oh, you can, uh, I'm just asking if Nyman Ranch allows that type of thing be something I would right. consider. Uh, so I have done a dewormer to my digging stuff, and yes, I, I believe I could plant it. Right. Uh, so I have done a dewormer to my breeding stock, and yes, I, I believe I could plant chicory in my pasture if I wanted to. Um, Okay, and Dana again is saying that rolled oats are an excellent uh, form of deworming. I'm not as familiar with that. Um, but it, um, I think any time you have a lot of, of fiber in the diet, it would probably force a lot of those worms to be um, released. Very good. 
Uh, The other thing that you might want to keep in mind is when you've got baby pigs and you're just starting to wean them is, again, is another time that I would incorporate whey product and a little finer grind. And I would probably start them at about a 22% ration. And, uh, and you can, again, use that milk bread product as part of your protein. I'm just throwing things out there that might help people. Could you talk a little bit, Liz, about, you mentioned sunflower, too, about the availability in your area mm -hmm. and cost. Could you talk a little bit? Well, the availability, um, I do know that some of the seed companies are selling more of the sunflowers. Um, here in Iowa, it doesn't seem to be as popular. It's a 120-day um, just a uh, growing season for it, so we're kind of tight here in north central Iowa for that. But um, I grew my own so that I would have it for rations. But I do know a lot of the Wisconsin growers are actually growing it with the maize um, so that they can, they can actually chop that and then they feed that to their cows. So they have the sunflowers, the corn, and the stock and then they incorporate that into their dairy diets and the soybean or the excuse me the sunflowers serve as the protein source in there and it's highly digestible and very good again a ruminant can get by with eating the the holes and everything so much easier I'm not sure I know on pigs we have to watch again on how much fiber we're putting through there and so I, I again wouldn't suggest any more than 50 percent of the ration price wise I, I would put, I just haven't seen enough of it on the open market where I would know where the price would be. But now do you... It, yeah, it does, does get tough that way. Okay, and then there's a gentleman here that's thinking that cabbage, actually anything that is a vegetable, you could put out for your pigs. I'm not really sure how I would incorporate rations with cabbage in it, but anything out of the garden, whether it be your potatoes, your um, the tomatoes that you you know have a hole in it, the fruits, anything, apples, all of that can be given to the pigs without any issue, I would think. Uh, I would just kind of treat it as a, uh, I guess, a slop. I'd put it above and beyond. So I would almost, I would feed them their regular ration, but you might be able to cut it back if they had all these extra vegetables that they could be eating. It would just help you keep your food cost in check. And Dana has here a, a book that he says talks about how to use alternatives like vegetables. And I guess my thought there is is that you'd have to, it's, it's so seasonal, I'm not sure you could actually set your ration by it. But if it's a lot of tubers like potatoes and that type of thing, again, I wouldn't exceed one third of the diet because you don't want to overdo because a lot of the tubers and stuff don't have the the carotenes and some of the other things that we're needing in the diet that we offset, like with the alfalfa or the um, darker greens or through our vitamin mineral mixes. I was thinking, my first thought, I guess, was potatoes, because uh, of all the different things you talked about, that would mm -hmm. seem to be the most readily available. I was thinking, available. my first thought, I guess, was potatoes, because that... Uh, um, yes, and a lot of times people have potatoes that are going bad, or if you even got tied in with a grocery store chain and you could pick up some of these um, 
vegetables that they were going to throw away anyway, you might be able to actually start incorporating those in some of your diets. And uh, Angie Watson is asking about growing fodder to sell. Um, I'd like her to be more specific as to what type of fodder she's looking at and if she's looking to feed that to pigs or to cattle. And Dan Wilson says that cabbages will flavor your pork meat. So that's an interesting thought that I hadn't even thought about. Uh, uh, ben uh, Brown is talking about milk, and I'm assuming you're saying that it flavors the milk, but a lot of people say that's a delicacy. A lot of the Danish people will milk feed their pigs just so that it'll have that milk or that more um, light color in the pork, and so that's kind of deemed a, a delicacy, I guess. Okay, it should be around 8%. 0.8% protein on the liquid whey. Okay, that. Thanks, Kevin. I wasn't sure um, exactly what that was. I've always on the liquid. I've always used the dried. And but again, on the liquid whey, I still wouldn't go over 10 to 12 pounds. Well, I don't know um, if I've given everybody the kind of rations that they were looking for, but we can certainly try to incorporate those in, and then you can sit down and make a ration from what you have available, I guess, is the key. I guess. What do you look for if, if you're going to work with a grocery store or some, like your garden vegetables or something? When, what do you look for when something is yeah. going out of? If you're going to work with a grocery like, store or some, like your garden bad, vegetables what, or something, what, what when, do you draw the line when something is going is, out of, this is too bad to like, my animals or this is okay, like going bad. What, what, what I guess I would throw it out there and if they ate it, I would say it's okay and if they didn't, then they would probably the turn their nose up okay, at it. I, can feed it I know they're not as picky as we are. <laughs> and, um, and I'm not sure where a grocery store draws a line as to what they deem is, is no longer sellable. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's uh, still in pretty good condition, I mean, as far as a pig would be concerned. Uh, let's see. Alfalfa for hogs, cows, and horses. Um, I'm not sure what Angie is asking, but I would say yes to all three of those. Uh, the horses, you want to watch the calcium content in alfalfa, but as far as hogs, we need the calcium, and the same thing with the cows. Um, horses can sometimes get stones if you use too rich of an alfalfa. Um, I guess I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, this is why a lot of horses, they go to grass hay. Have I done any dairy rations using um, small grains? The dairy rations, you can almost do exclusive on small grains with, with cows. Um, if you use oats or ground oats and whole oats with molasses, that will give you your energy that you might be lacking in your oats and uh, put that with an alfalfa hay and you pretty much have your ration for cows. And Angie's asking what kind of fodder she should grow. But Angie, tell me what is it for horses, cows, and, and uh, pigs? Um, and alternate rations for chicken feed. That's really what I do is the chicken feeds. Um, 
pigs are kind of, you know, the price of organic grains are so high that we have very few people that can afford to feed pigs on organic grains. And so for your layers and broilers, I like to use a combination of like what I was describing for the pigs. Um, you want to use um, a base of corn and then bring in your soybean meal, add some ground peas. I like to stay away from fish meal on laying hens because I'm afraid it will taint the taste of the, the eggs. And then I come in with barley and oats and wheat. Um, if I'm using alfalfa meal in a chicken feed, I don't exceed 5% because you kind of lose the effect of it after that. Um, and then uh, I just kind of keep it, oh, I want to say that we probably run a combination of probably half of it in small grains, half of it, you know, if I have three quarters of the diet is going to be corn, I'll take half of that three quarters and I'll make that small grains, then the corn, and then about 300 pounds to 350 pounds of soybean meal for chickens for the layers primarily for about a 16 percent. And as far as the cost of molasses, you have to let me know if you want it organic or if you want it to be conventional. Organic molasses is running, let me look it up here, I want to say it's running about $48 a five gallon pail on organic molasses. We kind of have quite an array of questions coming through here. On that organic molasses, I have it priced at forty-eight seventy-five for a five-gallon pail. And I think Joel answered Angie's question perfect. Uh, for horses, you want grass. For cattle, a legume grass mix, and for pigs, alfalfa. Do you have any more questions, Drew? I guess what I'd tell people is look at what you have and determine how many different grains you have. And then I just try to incorporate in your least cost grains because I think the livestock will will thrive on any combination as long as it's a balance of protein to carbohydrates. I don't really have much more to add. Um, if you have specific questions, we could sit down and work with the grains that they have. I think we're just about to the question and answer session now. Oh, I've been kind of working through their chat box right along here. I think we're just about to the question and answer session here. Uh, Kevin has asked if I have a favorite book. I have a couple of different books that I use. Um, I like, it's called Raising Small Livestock for the Homesteader Handbook. It's uh, by Jerome Bellinger, B-E-L-A-N-A-G-E-R. And it goes through everything that you would do on a small scale on farms. And a lot of it is to help with what you can grow yourself. I like to use Feed and Feeding by Morrison. And I also um, use the Iowa State Animal Feeding and Nutrition book uh, with Marshall Jurgens and uh, Christian uh, Bergendahl.
I don't know, should I have written all that out in the box? I'm not good with long silences, so I'll let you fill. Right, well, I one, last, <laughs> one last question for you, Cindy. Uh, you said your, your approach is kind of look at the brain that you have and kind of start. So I know. So I guess one last the, one last question you for you, Cindy. Uh, you said so your your approach is kind of look at the grains that you have and kind of start computer. from there to. to well, I I was going to say, I make a point to to have as many grains on, on hand as I can. What the main grains I use would be corn, soybeans, ground peas, barley, wheat, oats. Uh, we use a lot of flax in our diets. Um, we use some fish meal, alfalfa meal, and those are kind of our base that we build all of our rations around. We do add whey and yeast compounds and kelps, um, but the main grains we bring in are from as close to my mill as we can get. I do have to go up to North Dakota to get my peas and my flax, but for the most part, everything that I use is growing right here in Iowa. And, uh, and Vic put down another suggestion on uh, uh, feeding small grains to swine. And that is one book I'm not familiar with, but it does sound like it would be a good choice. But, uh, and do you grow many of your own grains, Drew? Yeah, I grow my own corn. Uh, well, I, I use uh, a lot of bison I, I grow my own corn. Uh, the I rest, do, I just well, I, I do uh, buy some alfalfa from a neighbor, but everything else is bought. Well, um, I, ju I was just curious, thinking about Diamond Ranch, uh, the way they price your pigs is based on the price of corn and the price of, well, conventional corn, conventional soybean meal to uh, for the four months prior to when you sell them and I'd just be curious how how they would react if I see that uh, you know, Dana and Luke both have, have questions primarily for primarily corn and soybean meal raised on those two oh okay. Okay, uh, to answer Luke's question, yes, I do grind my own feed. Uh, it's a PTO grinder, and all the, so the bulk of the ration comes from corn, which is homegrown, and right now I'm using alfalfa for my gestating gilts. Um, but yeah, the rest, the rest comes from the supplement, and soybean meal comes uh, from a truck, yes. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Dana, too, for your suggestion about uh, decreasing corn in uh, in the summertime. Ooh, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good question too. So right now, uh, on our farm, we've only got capacity, I guess, for one one uh, one bulk bin for a supplement item. Uh, so right now it's soybean meal and the rest of my supplement comes in bags um, but I could work with my mill, feed mill to get I think so if I wanted some canola or I wanted something with barley or wheat, oats, you know other things I could have them mix it up and bring it out to our farm um, yeah I think that answers the question well, as far as the long-term trends for corn and soy, um, <laughs> I, I guess it all depends upon the weather. I do think um, as a mill, 
I think that the price of grains are kind of toppy looking for right now. Um, we're seeing some slide on the conventional side, and that is dragging on the uh, uh, organic. But again, if we run into a dry, dry spring, I think corn and soybean prices will go back and probably set new highs. Um, as far as what should farmers be looking for in their feed of livestock, I think what we have to do is be able to incorporate both cold weather and summer crops. And this is why the cereal grains, I think, looked so good this past year because it did have the rains or the moisture and we wound up with some really nice small grains and uh, whereas the corn and soy suffered a little more in the in the drought and so again it's you have to look at what's available to you and then um, look at your least cost and then try to build around the least cost and then use the minimum amount of those grains that you, you need such as soybeans or, or a protein source and then uh, and try to limit how much you have to incorporate of those products. Did you need to talk about which which of the small grains had the most success perhaps in your area or, or your radius? Well, you know, if I were talk about which if I were more familiar with the triticale, the that 14.7 percent protein area or, or is is a radius. huge asset as far as is knocking back how much uh, other proteins you would have to supplement in, because like your sow rations, you only need to be at a 12 to 13 percent, and if you figure a growing pig can do well on a 16 percent ration, you only have to add less than 2 percent protein supplement if you were using the triticale. And so that would be uh, one of the small grains that I would certainly look into. Uh, of course, oats we know grow well in Iowa, as well, and the sooner they get it in, the better. Um, barley grows well, and we've had good success with some of the wheats. And, uh, but as far as you know, the most common small grain grown in Iowa, I would say it's oats and then probably barley. But if I were if I were you, Drew, I would look at that triticale real serious if I was looking at growing a small grain. I guess we'll just wait and see what everybody's typing here. Okay. What about rye? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess rye is kind of a combination. Well, I don't like rye because I don't like rye. Um, I think it's a bitter grain, and so if I think it's bitter, I figure the livestock think it's bitter. It's, I shouldn't think that way, but I don't like working with rye. Um, I was going to say, I don't know if I would like rye right now. It's kind of a thirsty crop from what I hear. I, I never grown it myself, but I do think and it'll rob a lot of nitrogen as well. I was going to say, I don't know if I would like rye right now. Is it now. similar to wheat in its composition? From what I, hear. I, I would say that rye would probably be more similar to that of triticale, because I think it's a crossbred of rye and maybe wheat. And, and so that might be... Um, uh, more similar to to what that is, but I'm not I'm not that familiar with rye because, like I said, I just don't use it in my rations. And Joel, he's made the comment that for gestating sows, putting them out on a alfalfa pasture. I'm a big believer in putting um, sows out on alfalfa pastures. I just think that you'll get all your protein needs um, taken care of. They're getting exercise while they're out there. I just think it's really the way to go. And then you can supplement them if you feel that the pasture is starting to, to suffer. But I'd use cereal grains and, and uh, alfalfa pasture for all my just hitting cells.
Um, I think you could probably get by with it. You can do a 50% corn, 50% uh, wheat, and then with a little bit of supplement. So I'd be curious how that would work with the triticale as well. Um, Luke is asking about growing small greens, bushels to feed, head to finish the uh, bushels. Do you, can you cover that? I would From use. my perspective, I, I would look at what approximately we had. I hope Threshold. I hope to finish in the year and we kind of backtrack and say here. Yeah, I. I guess from my perspective, I, I would look at what approximately had I hope had I hope to finish in a year and kind of backtrack and say your figure on the higher end and say how what is my least cost way to feed them if it's small grains or you know or, or to answer sure Luke's I'll question know, about you know, uh, using it as a cover crop. What I oftentimes would think is that you could use a, like a winter wheat or a winter barley as your cover crop and then interseed in the early spring, maybe with some alfalfa, and then you could take the, the, the uh, winter crop off in, in mid-July and then you would have your alfalfa already in the stand. And, and I don't know if a lot of people do that. I know they do it with oats, but uh, I don't see why you couldn't early in the spring get that alfalfa in there as well. And I see Drew, Dan has used that 50% corn, 50% triticale, and they said they've had good trials with it. I guess to answer Luke's question about growing alfalfa and small grains, uh, it's more been, I guess, why I haven't so far has been the opportunity cost of raising corn and soybeans. Yeah, I think it would be hard to forfeit a lot of acres if you've got a corn and soybean rotation going. But if you had some off acres that you could, it'd be a great place for your pigs. of our pasture last summer at, at our field day in August and so it's mostly grass uh, I'm not sure all the different types but that's where I'll have my again Dan is saying that the uh, that, that could possibly be a place to seed some, some specialty crops in there it might be a good that might be a good yeah, um, it, it appears that there's been quite a few uh, trials done with the triticale and uh, corn rations, and that there was no difference in the carcass. And and so, but on Nyman Ranch, don't you have to do like a taste test to prove your pigs, or is that no longer true of Nyman Ranch? That's a question I don't know the answer to. Uh, so, so our, our customers can come out and check out our farm anytime if they'd like. I think. Mm, that's a question I don't know the answer to. I haven't let me yet. So, so our our customers can come out part and weeds, yeah. check out our farm anytime if they'd like. Okay. I think. Are you familiar? I do you see what Joel has written? He says that triticale is part wheat and part. Sakale? I'm not familiar with that. But I thought it was a type of rye that uh, triticale was crossed with. A kind of, okay, so Dana agrees the type of rye.
you. Are there any additional questions? If nothing else, I, one thing I will definitely take from this seminar is to, to work with my lead mill and look at realistically what all of my different options are. So I guess are if, if, if nothing else, I uh, one thing I will definitely take from this seminar is to to work with my feed mill and look at realistically what all my different options are for grains and one of the problems that you'll have with conventional feed mills though is that they are primarily just soybean meal and um, and corn they're not real creative I will give you that <laughs> But, you know, if you get up closer, I don't know where you get your feed, mm but uh, St. Ansgar Mill might have a greater variety for you um, just because they do handle a lot of different food grains as well. And the ones that don't pass for food, you might get at a pretty decent price at the feed price. The major ones, I, I get my feed from Hubbard. Feeds in between Alpha and Storm mm -hmm. There's also uh, BFS, is another local feed mill. Mm -hmm. The major ones, I, I get my feed from Hubbard. Well, as long as they're willing to look at more, you know, I'm kind of forced to um, incorporate small grains because my growers are forced to grow small grains every third year and or every fourth year. And so we try to use those small grains because if they don't have a market for them, it just cripples them as far as um, staying in the organic program. So we've made a real effort over the years to um, try to incorporate the different grains into the rations so that I have a ready market for their small grains. And, and that, that has probably helped me have so many additional grains to work with as well. Yeah, we just have not had a lot of access to canola, and maybe it is because it is uh, a product that's more GMO oriented. My feed provider also, um, and so that could be another thing. A little bit too. That's why I mentioned canola. As far as adding or record keeping for adding diverse grains to my feeding enterprise, it's no more difficult than uh, just running corn and beans. As long as I have a bin for the different grains, um, and then like with flax, it's a difficult grain to keep in a bin, and so we just use the uh, use totes for that. And if I get in a real pinch, well, you can just use gravity wagons inside the mill. Um, for specialty grains that I may not have large quantities of. But as far as the record keeping, it's I have to keep records of every grain that comes in and out, so it's just not that difficult. I think the record keeping would be fairly fairly easy. I would think uh, so think too. I mean, every right time we put together a ration and we give them the bill, they can see right away uh, whether or not it was more expensive or less expensive than changing their the rations. previous time. And Dane is asking about whether or not I can find an organic source for chicory seed. I would guess that Johnny's Seed House might be one place to start looking, and um, I'd have to, I get a lot of seed catalogs, I'll just look through and see which one has it in an organic uh, seed for the chicory. But chicory is not something you find, that and comfrey are kind of difficult to come by.
I've never tried to seed it. I, I can't imagine using a whole field of it. I think it's... Chicory seed, something you, you could seed. I would have to read on it. I know that a lot of times people will take a lot of the different herbs and they yeah, will I run and plant those in the uh, fence rows. And then the animals or the livestock can go in and choose what they need of that because a lot of times they are medicinals. Okay, Dana seems to be a lot more. Um, familiar with chicory than I am. I do know they put it in coffee down south. <laughs> okay. Is anybody doing side-by-side -side comparisons of different feed mixes? Um, we test the feeds, at least the blue stem feeds. We've, uh, we've done feed trials on them, but we don't do side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, I guess I haven't done a full out trial. If anybody wants to do one, I'll certainly um, work with them on it. Yeah, and like I said, most of the feed uh, products I put together are for for poultry. The bulk of my business is poultry, um, just because the high price of feed has driven me out of the pork business. <laughs> okay, Carl. Well, I just wanted to jump in and say uh, thank you very much, Cindy and Drew, for your time tonight and sharing your experience and questions and discussion. I, I feel like we there's another burning question in the audience. We still have time for, for more questions, but I uh, just wanted to thank you both uh, for, for being speakers tonight. Um, I hope I was a help. <laughs> Been my, been my pleasure. I've learned a lot, and thank you, Cindy. And thank you for um, inviting me. It's been my been my pleasure. I've While those questions lot, are coming in, potentially, you, uh, I wanted to acknowledge our funders that make it possible for us to pay our farmers for sharing their experience and knowledge. And uh, those those funders are the Beginning Farmer Ranch Development Program. Uh, USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture uh, grant, part of the Farm Bill. Um, the USDA Risk Management Agency Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, Cedar Tree Foundation, Ag Ventures Alliance, a great group in, uh, based out of Mason City with farmers all across the state, and uh, John Deere and Cliff Bar as well. So I appreciate uh, their, their funding that makes it possible for us to do this uh, Farm in Our Series. And, we hope you can join us again for a future Farminar, and uh, next week we're going to have one on choosing the right uh, genetics for a grass-based uh, system with three different grazers. We're all going to be kind of talking about their 10, 15 years of experience um, on their own farms selecting for genetics that work on grass. So if you're interested in that uh, topic, join us next week, and, and then uh, we will continue to have Farminars each, uh, each uh, off-season. It seems like a great way to, to connect with folks uh, without without having to commute. Cindy, did you want to answer that last question or comment? Uh, and then we can call tonight. About the oats raised in Iowa tend to be lighter in weight and higher in protein. Um, I'm, I do know that uh, oftentimes we have lighter weight oats um, here in, in Iowa versus South Dakota. 
uh, because it's very common for them to have 40 pound plus. And I think it has as much to do with when we get them planted and, and our humidity when we're drying them out. Um, as far as the protein, I guess I, I always just run them as a 12 percent, 11 to 12 percent. And so I haven't actually checked them out accordingly. But we had a lot of 40 pound oats here in Iowa this past summer. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, we will call it an evening, and, and we hope you all see, join us on another farm in our soon. And thank you very much for being here.